In this section, we're going to start from scratch. We are going to define our state space. In the end, we are going to reach Hamiltonian mechanics, but we'll see by doing everything one step at a time, we are going to uncover some of the hidden assumption that we might have had. So we are going to make everything explicit. So let's suppose we have a system, and this system can be prepared in different configurations. We call each of these configurations state. And so we define a set called Bix S, which is the set of all the possible states that our system can be in. And we're going to have a, a little s, s a, s b, and s c, be all the different states that the system can be prepared in. Each state has a label, which is a, b, c, and d. And this label can be anything. In physical system, it's going to be typically uh, either the way the state was prepared, so for example, it's uh, the beam of photons prepared at that energy with this particular polarization, or it can be an ideal measurement, so if we have a point particle, it's going to be the position and momentum at a particular time t, or it could also be the future evolution. It's the state that if I put in a, mag a magnetic field, it's going to turn right. Identifying the right labels is actually the most difficult task in physics. It's the problem. Because once you have the right labels, everything works well. When you have the wrong labels, you can't understand anything. But we are not going to go into that. We just assume that somebody already gave the label to us, that somebody prepared uh, a procedure to identify the states, uh, to distinguish them the states, and for our purpose we can treat that procedure as just a label. So the important thing here is that we just have a mechanism to tell states apart so that we can create a proper set. Now another assumption that we're going to make on these uh, states is what I call the classical assumption. And this states that the system can be reduced into infinitesimal elements, and each element is going to have its own state, and we can keep track of the evolution of that particular, each particular element. So if you imagine a rock, each, uh, uh, the, the whole rock, you can think it as made of little, as made of little tiny pieces of rock, each of them with their own position, and each of them with their own momentum. So now, with, because of this assumption, we can construct our, stat, uh, our set B, which is a set of all the possible states for these infinitesimal elements. And each of them is going to have their own label. Now, with this assumption, we can think of the full state as a distribution on the infinitesimal elements. So we can think that uh, 1% uh, of the whole set, it's in this particular position and with this particular momentum, this other 1%, it's in this other uh, position and this other momentum and so on. So, so the, 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 the whole state can be seen as a distribution on all the uh, infinitesimal element, the distribution is going to sum to 1, and each uh, element of the distribution is going to be greater than 0. But this mathematically is equivalent to say that uh, the states are unitary vectors of a real vector space, where the bases uh, uh, represent the states of the infinitesimal elements. So you see the classical assumption that says we can take, we can think of the whole thing as reduced uh, and we can reduce it to little pieces. It's the same, it leads mathematical to say that the, uh, the, the, the state is a real vector space. And this also tells us why point particles are so important in classical mechanics. Not really because the real states are made of uh, are point particles, but because uh, point particles give us the basis of this set. So we can think of the, 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 the all macroscopic uh, elements and uh, made up of little infinitesimal pieces, and we can track those infinitesimal pieces. And what these assumptions allows us is that we don't have to study the evolution of uh, 
of each set of each state individually, but we can just study the evolution of the bases individually. Because then once we know how the bases evolve, then all the states are just going to be distribution in those bases. And so we know how to, uh, to, to evolve the states. And this cuts down the problem a lot. And this is why this uh, assumption is so powerful. So now, now we have to put in determinism and reversibility in terms of the state mapping. And we'll start with, uh, uh, with a space made of discrete uh, bases because in discrete, uh, uh, in the discrete is, is easier to understand some of the properties. So here we have our set of initial states and here the, we have the final state and assuming determinant reversibility, it basically means assuming that we have a bijective map, bijective map between these states. So that for any initial state, we have one and one final state. And for any final state, we have one and only one initial state. Okay, so that's easy, but let's look at some properties that this, uh, this gives us. So let's consider a state, an initial a subset of an initial element. And we consider the image of that set, right? So for example, A goes to C, B goes to D, and C goes to B. So it's clear that if we start with N elements here, we're going to end up with N elements here because we have the bijective map. For, one, for each one here, we have another one here. So the evolution is going to preserve the number of elements in a subset. So whatever thing can we say? Now let's consider a subset of, of some states and let's consider how many states come in or go out to this from this set. Well, so for example, A and, and goes to C, C goes to B, they all remain the set, B goes outside and E comes and comes from, from outside. So it's clear that for, for any elements that goes out, there has to be an element that comes in because the number of states here and here is the same. So what needs to happen at the boundary is that the flux of states coming in is to, is has to be equal and opposite to the, uh, to the flux of states coming out. So at the boundary, the flow of states has to be zero. But now let's look at these two properties that we have found and compare them to the property that we had for Hamiltonian mechanics in phase space. So in Hamiltonian mechanics, we said that the flux across any closed boundary is zero. And here we said that the flux in and out of a subset is zero. In Hamiltonian mechanics, we have that any region evolved in time preserves the area. And here we have that any subset evolved in time preserves the number of elements. You see, these two things are the same. It's just that this is for the discrete case and this is for the continuous case. So the bijective map already has uh, this uh, element, the, the, this idea of flux being conserved and number of states area being conserved. So what we need to do is to make the limit right in such a way that we're not going to lose, we're not going to forget uh, these two properties. And how do we do that? Well, now we have states and we have, these are going to be labeled by X and P. And we'll start with a set of discrete states and then we'll take the continuous limit of this. So we have here a number of states, uh, initial states and their image, their final states. So let's, let's take a region R that it's big enough to cover all those states. And we do this, we, we consider everything and only the things that goes inside the region and we ignore what's going outside so that X and P now are free to be, uh, you know, to go on and on to infinity and our proof is not going to, to care about that. So we take this region R and we divide it in N cells, all of equal area. Now, you could generalize the proof so that uh, the area is not rectangular and the, uh, all the, the, the cells are of different sizes, but uh, this is just much easier for me to, to show it and to explain. So we'll just do it like that. So the, the total uh, area of R is A, and uh, uh, this is going to be equal to N, the number of cells, and A, which is the area of each cell. Now, the area represented by the initial states is just going to be the sum of each 
uh, of uh, each cell covered by all the uh, initial states. And so it's going to be the number of initial states times A. And the area of the final uh, for the final states is going to be the same. And so it's going to give us the number of final states times A. But we know from what we said before that the number of initial state and the number of final states is the same because of the bijective mapping. So we know that the area is going to be the same. The, the initial area and the final area are going to be the same. So now we can increase n. And if we increase n, a is going to go down. And But still, these, uh, these relationships are unchanged. We still have this relationship, and still we have that the initial area is uh, equivalent, to, it's equivalent to the final area. And so we can now make the limit, and you see, since this relationship it does not change on as we are increasing n, that relationship is also going to stay the same for the limit. So we make the number of cells go to infinity, our sums are going to become integrals, we're going to have these areas, and these two areas are going to remain the same. And this was our second condition for Hamiltonian mechanics, and as you see, we, we have that just for assuming the bijective mapping and by making the limit right. So now we see that Hamiltonian mechanics for one degree of freedom is truly just determinism and reversibility. We just need to uh, impose a bijective map between the infinitesimal states and we find everything. Each state, it's really a, an infinitesimal cell of, uh, of phase space. It's not just a point. So if we are not preserving the area, we wouldn't be preserving uh, the, the, the number of states that we would have there. And so we wouldn't really truly have a bijective mapping. So in all the other cases that we had these two relationships, now we see that they all come just from one, just from bijective maps between infinite amount of states. And so this should have, should give you a, a nice big overall picture, how all these elements, how, however we look at Hamiltonian mechanics from the math, where we are preserving the area, from the measurement, where we are preserving uncertainty, from the thermodynamics, where we are preserving energy, from information theory, where we are preserving information entropy, and from state mapping, where we just have bijective mapping, all these things are all going to tell us that Hamiltonian mechanics is the same as requiring determinism and reversibility.